celebrating 20 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. God. We, we were having a conversation um, prior to this conversation, and we were talking about, you know, you were saying to me, really, if you strip away all the titles and all the, that you are a sensitive spiritual man. Um, one of our other, one of the other people that we know, um, Bill Haslam is sat in that same chair. And he probably would say the same thing. So you've achieved this, but on the inside, you're a sensitive human being. And, but we're in this world where it's go, grind, it's build, it's expand, it's... And if you say that, I think it was Clayton Christensen at Harvard, how will you measure your life? He talks about the struggle that he had because his faith was informing how he led and how he served. And I know that that faith is essential to you. And I know that as a man, you also, you cherish your spirit as well. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Wow, that's a big topic, a uh, real big topic. Um, as it relates to JTV, I, I would say that when we remodeled our boardroom, uh, a number of years ago, I intentionally placed two paintings of significance in the boardroom, both in the same palette of colors. One is a secular scene of New York City done in an abstract style, and the other one is, is called The Story, which is also an abstract scene, but it's the story of the life of Christ. And when we put these two paintings in our boardroom, I challenged our executive team to live with Christ-like principles and carry out our business successfully in the secular world, represented by this painting, but with the ethics um, and the demeanor of Christ in a Christ-like way. Can we be successful that way? And it's my conviction that we can be, that we can, be, that we can live out our faith, uh, our, our sense of values and our principles in a way that, that helps us to be successful, not as harmful, and a lot of companies today, we have this anti-religion mentality. Um, some of it is, is a, a disguise for being, well, it's not just, there's a disguise out there in the form of, let's say, tolerance, respect, diversity. You can use different words for this, but really there's, a, there's an anti-religion undertone in a lot of businesses, which I think is regrettable because Deep down inside, most human beings uh, feel that spark of creation, that, that creative act. When you look into the universe, for example, you can't help but feel wonderment, right? And that, and that inspires religious notions, and, and we shouldn't suppress those. We should encourage those. There's a, there's a psalm, which is one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 8, when, uh, and, and when the psalmist David is thinking about the stars and how they've been placed in the skies. He says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? In other words, who is man, mankind, humanity, that the God of creation, the master of the universe, the one who has deliberately set every star in its place, as, as many as we can't count, that he should care for us as people, as human beings, it's a marvelous thing that, that I think we ought, to, that we ought to think about. We ought to spend a lot of time thinking about why God cares about human beings. And he manifests that care uh, in, the, in the story of Christ, which is a story of redemption, a story of salvation, a story of restoration of humanity, which tends to be broken, and God, who is perfect. And Christ stands in the center in that chasm to bring broken humanity back to him. 
I love the painting in the Sistine Chapel where you see God's outstretched hand and man's outstretched hand, and they're almost touching there. Because the God that I believe in is a God that wants to be involved in the personal lives of people, who wants to hold his hand outstretched to people so that we can reach up and, and, and relate to him in the way that he wants, and, and, and he can bring us home as his children. He, he wants that for us, and I think that should inform a lot of what we do. But the modern day notion is <laughs> right. none of that shows up in the workplace. Right. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. We are a global company. We have offices in Mumbai and Jaipur and Bangkok and Hong Kong abroad, mostly supply chain offices. And of course, we have our uh, corporate offices here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, how have you had to grow and what's the difference between Tim Matthews, the great attorney, Tim Matthews, the CEO? There's a difference there. Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to use the word great. I, I, I don't think that. But I but I believe in our team. I believe in certain principles that I've have taken on as success principles in, in life. And really, those principles haven't changed from the time I practiced law to the time I've been the chief executive officer of JTV. Um, things like aspiring to be excellent, yeah. which I strongly believe in. Things like a work ethic. I always tried to finish my work early when I was a practicing lawyer. I try to finish my work early as, uh, as quickly as I can because I want to create capacity for tomorrow. I'm willing to work hard and work late today so that I have the bandwidth to take advantage of the opportunity tomorrow. Mm, that's good. If you were giving me um, advice on how to live my best life, I've got however many years <laughs> I wouldn't I dare do left. that, <laughs> first of all. What would, you, what would you tell me? What would you tell the people watching about possibility and, and living your best life? Well, I think it's, it's not, a, first of all, I, I would say it's not just about me, and it's not just about you. Uh, and I would challenge you with the question, what impact can you have on the lives of other people around you? Uh, when we think about becoming significant, and, and I love, I have a friend who describes this chronology in one's life. He says that, you know, when I was young, I was, I was really trying to survive. I was out for survival. Um, and then I achieved a measure of success. I was able to get a good job and I had an income and, and I felt successful because I had a, a good job. And then over the years I would put money away from my retirement and I started to develop a sense of security. So I, I go through these phases, survival and success and security. He says, but as I've grown older, my desire, my heart's desire is is to become significant. And it's an interesting thing to have that mindset of becoming significant, but not for one's own sake, mm. but for the sake of people around you. To have a significant impact that's positive in the life of another person, to me, is, is a real measure of success. And so I would challenge you with the question, how can you make a difference in someone else's life and even the small things that you might say or do, you never know when they can turn out to be significant in that person's life. We were talking about how small things can become really significant things uh, later in people's lives. I love your heart. Um, I love the, the courage that you just displayed in showing your heart as a CEO. Um, and I love what, what you guys are attempting to do here at, at Jewelry Television. I had a chance to, to talk to some of your customers. They didn't talk about jewelry. JTV is just family to me. I just love them. I definitely do have a great relationship with JTV and the Gem Store, uh, and they've helped me through the last two years for sure. 
there is a caring factor in jewelry television that you don't find elsewhere. I was diagnosed with uh, peritoneal cancer, which is the equivalent of ovarian cancer, in 2019. I've been to every jewel school except one year when I was in the hospital. And you, t you talk about somebody caring. Donna Burns and then sent me flowers and a whole group of things to work on in the hospital because I missed jewel school. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a caring organization. JTV has also given me 9,800 more friends because I started a group called the Beady Bunch. You can't just call them a gem store or a jewelry store. They serve people in so many more ways. I felt very isolated. And with JTV, I no longer felt that way because I made new friends. Um, if I hop on Facebook, even on the website for jewelry television, um, I have individuals who will hop on and ask me how I'm doing, when's my next chemo due, or praying for you. They are passionate about what they do, and that comes across on a phone call and on TV. Just being at JTV for the JTV experience, to me, is just once in a lifetime event, yet every time I go, it's so different. I do feel blessed in many ways. Um, I have a wonderful family and support system. I have a spunky 91-year-old mom who's also a JTV fan. You're working with experts who love what they're doing, and that makes a difference. It's family. It's part of my life. JTV is my family, and I get choked up when I tell them that. JTV is it's an experience. You have to live it. A warm, cuddly blanket wrapped around you with a JTV on. It's a connection. It's a bond with these folks, and they do really treat the customer as family. And uh, that's, that's needed right now. I think everybody needs to be feel that they're part of a family. They talked about a connection, right? It a was, relationship. It was relationship. Right. It was all the things that, you know, you speak of, and I think when we realize that we have that potential to leverage whatever it is that we were given to do to create hope and light and connection for people, I really do think that that's where, that's, that's where the magic happens. Um, for people who don't know the scope of jewelry television, uh, in a nutshell, what is it? How big is it? How many people? What's the business? Yeah, so we are about a half a billion dollars in revenue size. So we're substantial from a revenue perspective. We are a global company. We have offices in Mumbai and Jaipur and Bangkok and Hong Kong abroad, mostly supply chain offices. And of course we have our uh, corporate offices here in Knoxville, Tennessee with, with also distribution facilities here. Uh, we have, I, I don't know what the number would be at last count, maybe 17 or 1800 employees, families. I like to think of the families that we're supporting uh, through our efforts uh, here at our company. So we're, we're a very substantial uh, operation uh, from, uh, it's, not, it's not a mom and pop. <laughs> it's pretty big. Somebody's watching today and you are giving them a recipe for possibility. What's, uh, what's the recipe? Well, I think that it's maybe a lot of different things. I think it's, it is hard work. It's aspiring to be excellent. It's about education. Uh, I think there's lots of ways that we can break boundaries and break cultures. Uh, going back to our discussion earlier about cultures and their impact on us, and, and I use the words restraining and constraining because I think sometimes cultures put us in a box. You know, we, we can't go beyond our, our, our means. We can't go beyond, you know, what our parents did uh, or our grandparents or, or, you know, we can't be different from our neighbors. Well, all of that's malarkey, okay? That's, you know, that's what the world wants to teach you or to tell you that, that we should conform and we should be alike and that we should, you know, we, we can't exceed, you know, the expectation that has been set for us. I strongly disbelieve that. But how do you break those boundaries? I'll give you a little story about boundaries. My grandfather 
taught me to read at an early age. I was reading pretty profici proficiently by the time I was five. I was reading the newspaper. So when I was a very young child, I was reading a story about the feuding that was occurring in the hills near my hometown. And I don't remember the names of the families, but it was like the Hatfields and the McCoys feuding. And I remember innocently asking my father, well, when I grow up, who am I going to be feuding with? Mm, wow. Wow. So that, that's evidence of how culture influences wow. your mind. Uh, you know, you, you read something about what's going on in your community and you think that that's going to be part of your life in the future. Maybe, maybe it will be, but maybe it won't be. Hopefully it won't be. Do you work or do you draw? Who am I going to be feuding with? That whole, the impact of culture and the way it can restrain or constrain you. And if you don't have something to unlock the box. Exactly. Wow. So I was fortunate because my father was very intellectual and he, he strongly believed in education and I pursued a lot. I became a very inquisitive young person as a result of his influence. My mother was the can-do mentality. She, anything is possible would have been one of her mantras. You can be whoever you want to be. Uh, if you work hard and apply yourself and, and learn the trade, you can, you can do it, you can be it. So I think it was a, was a nice chemistry and uh, I wish that more young people would be exposed to that type of chemistry where there is on the one hand just a real thirst for knowledge and education and intellect and, and we, we just wanted to learn, soak it all up and learn everything about, about everything. Uh, which came from my father, but at the same time marrying that with, and if you do, here's the world and it's going to open up to you. And it's a, it's a, that's a nice combination. I think it's a great combination too in a corporate culture where people can be curious and they can learn and grow, but then there's space for them to act, right? Which is why I didn't need to get degrees to stay the CEO of GATV. Right. I didn't need to go back to school uh, to get the gemology degrees. I did that because I wanted to say to our people, go apply yourself, learn, you will advance, you will find opportunity. It may not even be what you expect, but doors will open if, if you do this. And I, one of the things I, I really like about our company is that there, we have a track record of having taken people from, you know, uh, entry level positions and move them all the way up into very senior executive leadership positions because they've applied themselves and they've worked hard and they've been diligent in taking their skills and growing them in a way that becomes more productive for the company. Tell me about your family. Uh, well, you're speaking about my immediate family. Yeah. So, I grew up in a uh, family of seven kids. I was the oldest. Uh, my wife, uh, Teresa Ann, also grew up in a family of seven kids, and she was the second oldest. In fact, uh, ironically, we have the same order of gender and almost the same ages, with a male being the first child and then the female and the male children to follow in exactly the same uh, kind of order. So we had a lot in common uh, in that regard. Uh, we always wanted a big family. We cherished a big family. Uh, we ended up having six children. Uh, the youngest will be 28 this year and the oldest will be 40. Uh, so we're excited about those and, and they're off in different places. Uh, uh, thankfully, we have two in Knoxville here. Uh, we have one who's married to someone who works uh, in the uh, technology department, uh, Kevin and Lauren Cowart. And then we also have uh, my daughter, Rebecca, who is not married, who works in our social media department. So excited to have at least a couple of kids uh, close at hand, uh, but we love family and we love big families. Any uh, grandkids? Yeah, so each of our four married daughters have four children and we have uh, one on the way as well, so. What do they call you? <laughs> uh, mostly just granddaddy. <laughs> just very, granddaddy. very simple, I guess. Um, my birthstone is the topaz, I found out. What's yours? Uh, mine is ruby. Ruby. What are some of the special things about rubies? 
Oh my gosh. Well, uh, Ruby is in the Corundum family, uh, which is, by the way, the, the same as Sapphire. So the difference between Ruby, which is red, and Sapphire, which can be many different colors, most people think of it as blue, is a coloring agent. So the interesting thing about Ruby is that it just takes a little bit of that coloring agent, typically uh, chromium, to make the red in Ruby and distinguish it from the blue in Sapphire. That's amazing. What's, what's interesting is that when I asked you what your birthstone was, and then I asked you to tell me something distinctive about it, your eyes lit up. <laughs> I mean, you were, the curiosity, the quality of the smile that you have on your face right now may be indicative of what curiosity and passion does. And I think that's what you bring to jewelry television. I think that's what you bring to the world. And, and I think you are a representative of what possibility looks like uh, every day. So thank you for being with us today on Anything Is Possible. Thank you, Helen. My yeah. pleasure. You're the best. Thank you.